Produced by Podcast Architects. Welcome back for part two of episode 15 with my guest, Adam Shaw. Uh, I want to transition to leadership because you know I've been uh, picking your brain the last couple of days. So I've always, um, number one, I've always counted myself as a mentee because I think you're always learning uh, and a lot of new learning for me, but also hopefully in a mentor role to some others, right? What are some of the things that you would um, that you would advise young, aspiring, um, the next generation of leaders that are coming up through the ranks? Some things that you've seen, because you've got a diverse background and a lot of perspective. What do you tell them to do to focus on the skills that they need, um, what not to focus on, or what not to, to emulate? Are there some things that you've picked out, like, all right, this is gonna help you progress? Uh, it's a great question, and one, uh, one that I actually find that I try not to group people together um, based on age or, you know, sure. uh, really for me, it's looking at someone and their unique perspective and background and what their p- potential challenge is mm-hmm. and then starting to help them better, in most cases, understand themselves. Uh, that's where I'll say one of the most valuable business tools that people can have is going to therapy. If you can do that early enough in your career and you understand how you're wired and how you work and you can get control of that and and really be more self-aware than the people around you, it will uh, release a whole other level of performance that you're able to really? achieve. I've, that's the first time I've ever heard of that, that lens for that. Okay. Then from that individual basis, uh, you know, I just recently uh, working with someone who is relatively early, early in their career. Mm-hmm. And a lot of the conversation we're having is around the fact that um, processes aren't linear. And, um, you know, I, the, the analogy that I use is really comes from my childhood of sitting at the dinner table and, and listening to my dad lament the fact that he priced a, a uh, job and he you know planned that it would take two days and if it wasn't for this and it wasn't for that and it wasn't for that he would have made so much more money mm-hmm. and I, I translate that to everyone is focused on all the things that if they didn't happen it would have been a better outcome right and I very quickly took a step back and said yeah but that's the job <laughs> these unplanned things are actually part of the role and so I think the core theme that I really try to instill in folks that I'm working with is about the resiliency that you have to have to know that even the best laid plans are going to have to adapt. Mm-hmm. And, and that normally starts with you know, people coming in with preconceived ideas, uh, whether it's about how sophisticated the processes and systems should be or how organized a company should be because of its scale reality is that at our core, it's all humans. Mm-hmm. And with humans comes, you know, uh, various levels of um, disorganization and right. emotion and everything else. And so as a core skill for folks trying to understand um, where do I go and how do I chart a pathway, um, one of the biggest things is this resiliency to understanding that the obstacles that you face are actually part of the pathway. You know, it's not something that's stopping you from moving forward. It's just part of the process that you're, you're moving through. Mm-hmm. Um, and there's a, a stoicism quote that around, the obstacle is the way. Yes. You know, so when you're hitting obstacles, it can feel disheartening. You can and start to question whether you're doing the right thing. The reality is that is, you know, uh, overcoming those barriers is part of that journey. Uh, I, I think we, we've talked a lot about, you know, folks trying to put people into boxes in terms of generations or right. uh, otherwise, from my standpoint, everyone can approach work with a unique perspective if they harness the power of understanding who they are and, and why they approach things in a particular way. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it, it's that self-management, self-awareness, and understanding that will enable them to access the resiliency to continually 
respond to challenge as opposed to react. Um, over the years, there will be many things thrown at everyone in their pathway, and you know, part of that understanding and that awareness is recognizing that you can control so much, right? And everything outside that is all just part of the fun of you know, <laughs> the journey pathway. Yeah, um, we talked a little bit about identifying talent. Um, it's been my experience that there's I, I try to classify it in three groups. You have your, your group that does pretty good um, day to day. You've got a, a high achieving group that's that's very innovative, creative, but a lot of times low on execution. And then every once in a while, you'll have a couple here or there that are innovative, creative, communicate, and can execute um, and put it all together and know how the the play um, how it plays out in the end. What's your, your, your key for identifying talent? Because obviously we're, we're growing, large company, looking for talent at, at every step. How do you identify talent? So I think identification um, can start with those that are actually already around you. Okay. Uh, and that's one of the things that's been very successful for me is accessing within people that are already your colleagues, you know, that, that glint of recognizing that it could be capable of more or that you know, they're really good at this particular thing and that would translate really well into a different role. Mm -hmm. You know, so in my role as a leader, I've had someone who started as an intern and was like a admin person who's now a, a program manager who's transitioned from what was going to be a career pathway in administration uh, with a business management degree right. into technical delivery of complex programs because I recognize within her that she had such a capacity to kind of field questions and deal with people that that was more valuable than anything else in the role of being a program manager than it was to have a construction degree. Sure. Um, because, you know, part of our industry dynamic is there's a bunch of people that know a hell of a lot about technical stuff. Right. The, the real talent gap that we have is people who have the soft skills to be able to listen actively, understand a problem, uh, express it in a simplified manner, and really create that connection between people. And that, that soft skills, which is a horribly overused term sure. these days, but those soft skills, um, I frankly, I'm still operating on the basis of, uh, I can't even sense that over a video call. I have to be in person with them to see the body language and the, the, the atmosphere. And I sometimes have to keep myself uh, self-aware about the fact that, well, I've continued to change in my career and <laughs> I'm no longer, you know, the, the peer. I have the, the three-letter title and so people can respond to me different. Um, and even allowing for that, I think the important um, central theme for me is engagement is the individual looking to do something and kind of agnostic to what it is they want to do but yep. if they have that glimmer or even better that fire in them then I love the opportunity to really help create a pathway and, and get out the way and see good stuff happen. How did you know when to push? Like you, you're talking specifically about someone that, that you saw something in. When do you know to give them the nudge that, that hey, I think that this is a better path or I think you can do more here? How do you know when that timing is? I am not too sure if I could aggregate all of those okay. instances, but. Because <coughs> we all think we're ready before we are. I, well, I mean, I think uh, I did. I, I think the complete opposite. <laughs> I couldn't disagree more. I think more people are ready. Before they are? Way before they think they are. Well, maybe it was just me. Maybe it's just me. <laughs> maybe it's just me. So f for me, it's been knowing that it starts with a little nudge, mm -hmm. and then I gauge the reception of the nudge, and then it's like, eh, I think they can do it, and maybe part of this exercise is, even if they can't, they're going to learn a hell of a lot from the experience. So then it's a full shove to say, no, we're doing this. Okay. And I've got your back because, you know, I, 
people will access the motivation to do good stuff when they're given an opportunity. What they need to have is the security that they have leadership that supports them in learning along the way and being able to make a leap. And it's, it can still be hard for folks to feel comfortable that they have that connection with uh, their business because even laterally with the whole COVID pandemic and uh, people's employment conditions changing, I think there's been a real challenge to the ability to build trust with folks around taking leaps of faith uh, because there's less been less human connectivity. And so I'm super focused right now in being as available as I can be to um, all of our team. Mm -hmm. And it really focuses around a core question that brings, you know, really the theme of my career path is, you know, why not? You know, like, let's make the leap together. We'll figure it out and let's see what's possible because the worst thing would be to uh, have thought about it and not tried. Give me a client success story that you really like felt it went unbelievably well and it just knocked it out of the park. Is there one that comes to mind where, that you can share? Well, when I first moved to the United States in uh, 2015, I was working on a transaction, a P3 transaction in higher ed and uh, my wife and our son uh, moved to Los Angeles and we'd been in the country for all of I think six weeks uh, and the client that I was working for it was the you know it was the coattails that we were uh, making this leap out to the US on uh, called me up just before Christmas and basically said uh, this this project you know our teams decided we're not going to pursue it anymore um, and at that point you know six weeks into this big adventure, it felt like it was all over before it had even started. Mm -hmm. But I recognized uh, in that moment that the reason why they're pulling out is there's a problem with the project. There was a perception um, that the budget wasn't achievable, that the schedule was too aggressive. Mm -hmm. And in that moment, I kind of thought, well, I understand this project, I also understand the problems that people are seeing with it. So I might as well roll my sleeves up and see if I can help the client understand just how far wrong they are. <laughs> um, and uh, like anything, timing worked in my favor and the client, which is the University of California, uh, advertised for some additional support to move the project forward. And it's a long, very entertaining story um, with some details that shouldn't be shared on the podcast, <laughs> but uh, effectively built a team uh, out of nothing to then go interview for the uh, role and beat out some very heavyweight competition who were already working on the project. And part of the uh, ability of winning the project, I learned you know, subsequent years later, was that I kind of did a all out uh, attack in the presentation of saying, here's all the things that could go wrong. Mm -hmm. And it just so happened that this client had been told for going on two years by all of the other consultants, everything will be fine. And so I, I connected with my audience, being the university administration, where they knew there was something wrong they knew that you know, a bidder pulling out must have meant that sure. they were on the wrong track. Yeah. And yet there was no authenticity to what people were telling them. And so I, as much as all contemporary training and, and coaching would tell you, don't go into an interview and, and have a negative uh, <laughs> sentiment, it really landed with them that, you know, here's someone finally telling us the truth. Right. We knew this seemed too good to be true now we have the data points, we can effectively work with you to understand how we de-risk what we're doing. Sure. And that resulted in you know, an immediate connection with the university uh, team that we're working with uh, because I really, by default, had to throw myself into it 
uh, and bring a team that was willing to throw themselves into it to really see it as a shared problem. Mm -hmm. And so as a organization, we flourished by taking on the responsibility of getting the outcome that the university had set as their goal, uh, resulting in delivery of the $1.3 billion project on time, uh, under budget, and to really uh, successful outcomes, most importantly, because the mission of the project was to create more capacity in the system for first-generation students. Okay. And we never allowed ourselves to lose sight of the social impact that the project was intended to make. And it was just, again, I mentioned earlier, it's one of those moments where everything just kind of fits the right people mm -hmm. in the right place at the right time, having a laser focus on driving an outcome. And it, it will continue to be one of the projects I'm most proud of. Um, and most importantly, because it's, it's had the effect that it was intended to have in terms of outcomes for that institution. You have to tell me the, the rest of that story off, off air at some point. I'm sure you got some, uh, some interesting um, stories behind that. Yeah. All right, this is the part where we get to go off the cuff a little bit and just ask things that I'm, I'm curious about because I'm very interested about Australia. Yeah. So talk to me about some of the touristy things that you did in Australia. Touristy, I can say I didn't really engage in because I was probably too much of a try-hard hipster to do all the touristy stuff. Uh, and I was lucky enough to make friends with a bunch of Australians, and so they kept me clear of the, the cheesy stuff. Um, I guess to debunk anyone's perspective, uh, the Sydney Opera House is kind of cool, but it's just a building. Uh, koalas do exist, but you know, in the right place, they're just roaming around on the road. Uh, I wouldn't touch them uh, for various reasons. Um, kangaroos do exist. Uh, did you box any kangaroos? I did not. Uh, I didn't hit any with a car either. That's that good. tends to be the main risk that people face. I, I would say some of the formative things that I enjoyed in Australia was really the outdoors. Uh, I was a city boy growing up and the ability to uh, be in the outback camping and, and sleeping in a canvas sleeping bag was some of the best experiences I had there. So I would really encourage folks who ever go there to uh, peel away from the tourist stuff and, and be in nature. You've had to pick up and move um, several times. How does how do you start the conversation with the wife, or does she know? Is there anything? Do you have a tell? Like, do you give it away when you're thinking about the move? Uh, normally, it involves an initial sprinkle of <laughs> some, something's happening, and oh, it could, or or maybe it's uh, suddenly we start watching something on uh, a show on TV that happens to be in the place. Uh, we're thinking we're so your it. your Netflix starts to become real regionalized. Yeah. You know, I've, I've thrown it out to her, you know, okay. as she watches, you know, Real Housewives of wherever. I'm like, oh, you know, <laughs> what, what do you think about living in New York? <laughs> that's funny. Uh, but, that, uh, overall, um, you know, that's one of my biggest career accelerants has been a, a, an incredible wife who understands that, you know, I'm working not for quote unquote my career, it's actually for our family's sure. overall uh, benefit. And she was an elementary school teacher in Australia and uh, also spent some time teaching in London. And when we met, uh, she really didn't get the chance to get into a full-time tenured position. Mm -hmm. And so her teaching career was kind of cut short by the opportunities that came uh, with my career. And But she does a tremendous job in our overall dynamic of um, knowing that she's supporting me and I'm supporting her in home, in work, and, you know, in in the initial move to the US, she was in the middle of the business too, yeah. you know, because it was such a Herculean effort to get something going. She had to be part of it and she was co-invested in it. You know, one thing struck me that you told us, I think it was last night, um, we were talking about relationships and stuff and you said, it's never 50-50, it's 100-100, you know, with just Absolutely. the support and doing as much as you possibly can, regardless of how the, the roles shake out. 
Yeah, I, I've got a couple of canned. That, that was pretty good. Okay. Out for people. So the, the 100 100 is pretty important. The other one is conversation, conversations should never be predicated around always or never. The minute those words are in a conversation with your spouse, you need to kill it and, <laughs> and walk away. Uh, and my uh, number three uh, would be when you enter a situation and your spouse is clearly wanting to get something off their chest. Uh -huh. It's very important, particularly for guys, <laughs> to catch ourselves and say, are we venting or are we problem solving? <laughs> and that one question will get you out of so much trouble from making the wrong call. Yeah. It's, it's changed my marriage ever since I read that somewhere. So whoever came up with that, thank you. Uh, that, yeah, that would have saved me a lot of uh, a lot of time and anguish if you just is this the one that I need to listen or am I help am I helping trying to yeah, that's a hundred percent accurate. If you could go spend a week with a with a CEO or a leader outside of of Answers Market Space, who would you choose? Who would you want to go spend some time with to pick their brain? Uh, that's a really interesting question because I have to say I don't really have any idols or icons okay. in business. I well, outside of business, it could be anybody. Just to to, it could be a guilty pleasure. Like I've always wondered about this person. Is there anybody that you say, you know what, this would be cool? Yeah, I'm really struggling with the broadness of the question. I'm trying to think. Uh, do they have to be living? No, we can play. We can play. Uh, I, I, I Anybody. Would, Time machine. I would love to access the brain of uh, Ferdinand Porsche to understand how he really came up with the concept of the Porsche shape and how he created this whole uh, structure around it's not broken, so we're not going to change it. And how that company has managed to maintain its identity through decades. Mm -hmm and still have an incredibly, you know, uh, good reputation and great product. It's funny that you say cars because I, I, I saw that an article that the DeLorean is coming back in San Antonio. Yes. And me being a Back to the Future guy, I was like, that's pretty interesting. That's pretty cool. So um, I think I would go probably guilty pleasure sports. I always wondered those, those high achievers, like, what is the work that they're really doing to get to that level? Like, all of the stuff that we don't see, and I think of Michael Jordan, um, because there's a lot of really gifted, talented, athletic people, but there's only, like, a small few. Mm -hmm. And so there's something in there with personality or work or sacrifice, and I always want to get a lens in, what does the work really look like? What are, are, are they really doing on a day-to-day -day basis to achieve that level, right? Because I think for a lot of our... our kids coming out of college or high school, there is sacrifice to be good and I believe to be good and to be great at anything. It doesn't always just come out of talent. Like there is a, a sacrifice that you're gonna have to put in somewhere along the line. Um, and like you mentioned your wife, my wife has sacrificed a lot for, because I believe kids deserve more and it's our job to figure out every way to give it to them um, regardless of the barriers. So. That's interesting, the Porsche, huh? So you, you're a Porsche guy. It's not the speed of it that doesn't have any appeal? There's, there's that too. Okay. You know, but uh, it just is a brand that kind of stands out on its own for me in terms of its kind of very clear identity of self and who they are and who they're not. One so if, if you had a front row ticket to a soccer match, who would you go see? Yeah, that would probably uh, land. It, it's not my sport. Um, I guess for old uh, country grudges, it would be an England Scotland uh, yeah. match, and just feel the atmosphere of the hatred. <laughs> 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 the visceral hate in the in the yeah. stadium. That's yeah. interesting. Anything that we didn't cover that you want to touch on that you can think of? Or highlight no I just think that uh, at this point you know 
I really hope for everyone's uh, mental health and sanity that uh, we're going to start seeing uh, some uh, positive trajectory on the, the COVID crisis and that you know, we're, we're able to collectively as a, as a country give ourselves a bit of a break um, in terms of understanding that the past two plus years have been a pretty changeable and yeah. uh, unplanned and that as leaders we really shouldn't try to race back to normal as quickly as we might instinctively want to do mm -hmm. because people are fatigued and have been challenged and you know whether it's loss of loved ones or it's economic distress or it's you know the mental health challenges of being um, secluded I think society is going to take a little bit of time to mm -hmm. kind of to get catch back to yeah. um, a, a sense of comfort with who we are in the world I agree 100 percent I know the schools could use a, a break to catch their breath and yeah. just re recalibrate uh, you know what, what they love to do instead of all of the outside influences that are happening around us. So I would concur with that. Well, thank you for being my guest and um, I'm gonna continue to pick your brain, particularly off camera, so. Uh, <laughs> my pleasure. It, it has been great and I look forward to talking to you more down the road. You too.